Hello and welcome back to the Not So Fit Couple podcast with your hosts, Lucy Davis. I'm Benjamin Holden. I'm excited for today's episode. It's going to be super insightful. I think I'm, do you know why I'm excited as well? I've, um, for those watching on YouTube, and also, if, if whether you're listening to on iTunes or Spotify or YouTube, well, if you listen on YouTube because you can't comment anywhere else, where do you think the audio is best from, Lucy's mic or my mic? Because... I'm not using the spit filter today, but I've got this like little ice cream cone on top. You still got a spit filter, but it's just it's around like a foamy one. Mic. I just feel like I've got lines. I've got so much extra room for activities. Do you know what I mean? I was like, I can move around. Like feel, this can this can go up today. and down. Like I'm like, woo! Look at me. Yeah, but Mike can do that also. But you usually with the podcast, we didn't used to have the boom arms, and you'd finish well, and I, your posture, your neck, your body. Yeah, was I was just literally like a pieces. fucking weapon on it. I was because yeah. I'm quite a little bit taller. I was literally sitting like that. It really speaking, hurts. and I feel like now I can sit proud, and I can open up my chest. Chest. Which actually helps you breathing and it actually helps you Does. talk more. I feel a lot more at ease. But yeah, obviously my, my voice is a lot more angelic than yours anyway. So that's going to play a factor. So we've got to be we've got to be careful of user bias here as well. But if you can drop a comment in and just let us know which sound, sounds better. I, I don't know if this is coming through the pot. I don't think it is. Lucy's looking at me like I've just shit on someone's dog. Well, someone's WhatsApping Ben and it's about, is your phone on aeroplane mode? Someone's what are they called? Pro Circle Coffee. Oh, I don't even honestly. know. Honestly, there'll be some weirdo from fucking China trying to sell me bobble pads, and it is. Okay, put your let's get it on aeroplane mode. Do you know what's so mad as well? Always before the podcast, I'm super in. I'm like, okay, aeroplane well. mode on, silent mode on. Ben, I said to Ben, have you got aeroplane mode on? Yep, yeah, don't need to ask. No, you asked me if it was on Ooh. silence. The phone is on silence. Okay, so I've got the aeroplane mode today, but. Well, you're going to dive in with a bit of an intro, aren't you? Anyway, I am. about well, our week. I obviously just this isn't coming out until next week, so you always you guys always listen to it a couple of days behind. But for everyone who's listened to the Ethan Supply podcast, we hope that you really enjoyed it because it's one of the most exciting podcasts that I think yeah, we've ever definitely. done. And I think the message that he drove home last week was so 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 important. And what we took away from it was like unbelievable as well. And I think it just really inspired me and Lucy and also inspired us to keep pushing this podcast out for everyone who needs to listen to it and I think it's really important that if you are taking anything away from it that you do the right thing and share this to people who may need the help or advice and continue to share it on story and stuff as well because we do like to see it on there at the same time as well if you guys have got any suggestions for podcast guests please if you're watching on YouTube just drop it in the comments and on this episode do it right now whilst you're watching drop some suggestions of who you'd like to see on the podcast because we are trying to kind of cram together not cram together we are bringing some yeah, names together to collate, aren't we mm-hmm. guests who share the same ethos as us i guess but also giving us a big insight into their life and maybe what they've been through or how they've overcome different obstacles and as always when you do when you guys do leave a review on the podcast we honestly can't even say how much actually helps like Mm. it actually helps the podcast significantly and if you are finding it beneficial and you find it enjoyable listening to us chat sorry i've got a piece of my mic it's not gonna be very nice for people listen sorry what's Um, that on your mic your hair it's like a piece of okay so the boom arm is already proving better that i have no hair stuck to mine no it was like a pube like an eight-year-old man it was weird but we've also what i'm gonna drop in the comments is or in the show notes we have also just launched the waiting list to our back to the gym challenge 2.0. Hopefully the last one that we'll ever do because we hopefully have gyms in, all, in their all lives for the foreseeable future. So we just launched that. There's going to be lots of details to follow with that. What is going to be inclusive of it? What we're going to be including in the program in all the new stuff, all the prize that we're going to be doing with it. So if you want to be in for a chance to be one of the first people to sign up and also the people who do sign up for the waiting list, this is for new members will receive a 50% discount code for when we do open the enrollment, which is going to be probably the week of that gym's open. Obviously, we've got this preliminary date, is that what you call it? Yeah, Of the 12th of April. Date. And it looks like at the moment, we're pretty much there with it. So hopefully, fingers crossed, we do get that date. We can get back to the gym and we're going to be kicking off this new eight-week challenge. What's important to note as well is you don't actually have to physically be in the gym. Like, mm-hmm. 
if you are continuing to train at home, that is great. That is fantastic. The school will accommodate for that. That is absolutely no problem. But it is called the Back to the Gym Challenge because gyms are open and people will be going back to the gym. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to train in a gym. I mean, I'm doing the challenge and I will also do some workouts at home. Yeah, I'll be the same. Yeah. So it it doesn't mean you have to go back to the gym. We know some people won't be ready to go back, that they don't actually want to go back. They have enough kit at home. But then we also know a lot of people are dying to get back in the gym and, you know, use a leg press. Yes, indeed. Well, that, that's it. the other thing. Since we've been in the home gym, we've moved Mazzy HQ downstairs, as we discussed in previous weeks. I've been absolutely sweating my tits off, you know, in there. Have you? Yeah, it's hot. What was really, really hot. <laughs> what was fun of the other day? <laughs> me and Lucy woke up and we still left the um the part of Mazzy HQ the f- first version up outside i.e. the gazebo <laughs> and we got up early hours of the Never. morning and we were running down the road or the back trying to trying to capture the gazebo no, the issue was so like we have like a closed kind of like a state um like back garden thing and you're like obviously next your neighbor's gardens and our freaking gazebo was in next door neighbor's garden obviously the so the leg had snapped someone like opposite dm me on instagram saying hi yeah your gazebo's blown over i was like yeah don't worry we've got yeah. it no panic and then i was sitting on a call doing check-ins on thursday and i just heard a knock on the back door and i was like what the fuck is that and i didn't think anything of it I heard the knock again <laughs> it was someone She's standing there with the top of the gazebo, gazebo. <laughs> and then i just said to her on instagram i was like oh, that's so embarrassing yeah, thank you funny. so much for dropping off the top of the gazebo that blew off into your garden and i was running down the road in my boxes and my flip-flops at like seven o'clock just running after this the side panels of the gazebo anyway that is no longer, it is now a piece of shit in the back garden. Yeah, it's so. all been fallen down now, so we have no favourite. We issues. will dive into today's podcast. So yeah. today's podcast is mine and Ben's ethos in a nutshell. It really, really is. And it's important for us that we do continue to to share this message. And is thick fit? Thick is fit. Thick is fit. The re- but before people start commenting in the, in the comments, I can go, that's not how you spell thick. We spell it thick is fit or thick and fit is F-I-C-K. Because the, the one the one thing that I w- really want to touch on really quickly is this whole culture that's sort of monopolized, is that the word, of you can be fat and fit. We, we know you can, as in previous episodes we spoke about, you can be fat and metabolically fit. But you're not fat and healthy like adiposity tissue still leaves you at a greater risk of hypertension heart heart attacks uh, cardiovascular disease strokes and and other chronic illnesses and and, and type 2 diabetes so this is why we put this title as thick is fit f-i-c-k because we want to kind of get that across to people that you can still be thick and fit and what we're talking when we're talking about thick we're talking about adding muscle tissue adding shape creating that um confidence in in your own body by being able to put weight on in the right areas yeah 100 percent. and i say it's mine and ben's ethos because it truly is we have a lot of people who are now on the school who have come from other people's programs where they've been on like a thousand calories and they're so scared of eating more food they're so scared of calories they can't do this they've cut out different food groups and to be honest, their metabolism's absolutely fucked and they can't get out of it. And it's it's frustrating for us as professionals as well. Yeah, we help people with fat loss. We help people with weight loss, but we do it sustainably. Mm-hmm. So our members of the school or our clients don't end up in that state where they're absolutely petrified of food. Yeah, and uh, that's, that's the problem. We're in this era now where the skin, we're like in this skinny society, and where less is more, smaller is better, and the age of editing tools is used to like sink, sink in your hips, take off inches, make you look like you've got a fire gap. And this is the toxic issue that we face for a lot of people. And what's skewing a lot of, a lot of people's perception of what is actually achievable. And also what is like actually healthy and what you do or don't need to look like. Yeah, I think it's definitely improved over the past do, yeah. four years in terms agree. of because four years ago it it truly was be a size zero and be skinny mm. and that that is all i wanted to be was was skinny i want i oh, the thigh gap was literally my dream i had it written on my um bathroom mirror 
and we've definitely come a long way in the past four years however on social media and especially for young girls and young boys it's still so prevalent that they in their heads want to be skinny and I actually think a really bad platform for promoting this is TikTok yeah the, I think it's the so un- culture, underregulated as well yeah it is massively un- unregulated but the like the the culture on TikTok um, obviously, it's very, very young in general. The pop, not just the population, but the age of people on TikTok is is younger. And you see other people promoting these like slim fasts or whatever, and being skinny is amazing and all of this. When realistically, hashtag thicker thighs save saves lives. lives. I actually think that it, was so my thing. By the way, I so created that. Did you? I you, added. You claiming that? I should. I should trademark that. Really? I would buy that domain. Yeah. If it's a domain, yeah, you may be able to do so. But I think that what you've just been over really deters people from making progress because the way that people believe and think that you should approach weight loss actually does the opposite. And that's why, like, it was really important from what we took from Ethan's episode last week in regards. He he completely changed his methodology with it. He'd been through every single type of weight loss methodology and process that you could imagine. And none of it fucking worked. Mm. And when he switched it to like focusing on body composition, focus on building lean body mass, he'd lost weight anyway. And this is the big thing that I've been speaking about on Instagram recently, that if you change the focus and change the goal to building muscle, as long as you're putting yourself in a calorie deficit, you're going to lose weight anyway. So don't overcomplicate it by looking at herbal teas, keto, like all these other weird and strange methods of weight loss. Put yourself in a calorie deficit, focus on building muscle because you will lose weight anyway as a byproduct and you'll probably look 10 times better. For example, me at the moment, I'm not in a calorie deficit, but this is the heaviest I've ever, not the heaviest I've ever been in my life, because I think I got up to 16 stone, which at the moment I'm sitting at 212, which is like 15 two, So quite a bit off my heaviest, but I'm like the heaviest I've been for the last five years and I feel better than ever. Not just in regards to like my physical health, but my mental health as well. Like I feel, I just feel in a better place with a relationship with food, relationship with training and, and the weird thing is this is all whilst training at home as well like i am i'm building muscle i'm getting thicker and i'm training in a, in a four by four bedroom downstairs with a squat rack and a couple of dumbbells so imagine what i'll do when i go back to the gym and this is the thing and we i'm going to touch on it quite significantly later when people say to me oh my goal my goal is to build muscle i'm like cool great let's up your calories oh no 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 no! like i, can't, I physically can't yeah. that is what i really really want to address today is that fear of food and i think this is becoming more widespread and more common on social media mm-hmm. I, I can't actually believe when like we were going through the, this podcast this morning and i was thinking i actually must get asked at least five to ten times a day hi i'm, re- I'm really scared to increase my calories can you direct me to how i can increase them And I didn't realize how common it was. And it probably just isn't on social media. It'll be everywhere. Mm -hmm. This fear among not even just young people, amongst a lot of people, basically, I I feel like people can get addicted to the high of weight loss or fat loss. And even when they reach their ideal goal, that is personal to them. They don't know what to do. And they just continue to lose fat. Or they they can't physically increase their calories because they're so scared. Yeah, well, we, as human beings on Earth, we weren't, we're not supposed to be here to like live out life and look like something that could fucking slip down a grid. Do you know what I mean? We're just not. Mm. You're, supposed to, you're supposed to be able to, you're supposed to eat to survive and be healthy and have b- body mass at the end of the day. You're not supposed to look like a stick. And we need to get away from this notion and help people to realise that there's certain points in our life where we're going to be a bit heavier and a certain points in our life where we are going to be a little bit lighter and that's called fucking summer and winter like you, you don't need to be like the same look all the time and no one's expecting you to be you're not you're not doing fucking competitions and stuff and like you, you're keeping lifestyle balance and keeping healthy and the people that you follow all year round who are uber shredded all the time they're potentially going to have like some health implications especially from like a me- metabolic or a, a hormonal balance standpoint and the chances are they're probably fucking miserable as well how do i know pardon me because i was one of them i remember was it last year or the year before i literally was in a deficit for the full year 
that's what fucked up my relationship with food massively and mm. fucked up loads of my hormone levels, fucked up my metabolic rate, fucked up my training. The year was just a fuck up. Whoa, it's a lot of Fs. Um, I do apologise. Just a point on that though, language. by the way, when Ben said shredded people, people were like, well, Lucy, you've got six pack, you've got abs. The thing is, my overall body fat would actually be around 20%. <laughs> I don't have like the lowest body fat just because I have abs. It doesn't mean my overall body fat percentage is super low. I'm very healthy. I just don't store fat there because people do always say to me, but, but like you must be in a calorie deficit all year round. How do you have abs all year round? I'm at maintenance. I've had abs since I was five years old. Then they're, they're not going anywhere. You had a, you had a fucking, you look like Rambo from the womb. I, I was honestly <laughs> like, I, I came out as Hercules, literally. But this is a point I do want to make. Like, no, I'm not in a calorie deficit all year round, like at all. I actually eat in maintenance most of the time. So it's really, really important not to compare yourself to other people because mm. you look at Ben and be like, wow, like, He's got abs. He's in incredible shape. His quads are so defined. Yeah, Ben doesn't store fat there either. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's actually, we're, when we're saying, it's people who are like, literally look like could, they could step on stage. Yeah. Like, that's the kind of low body yeah, fat that can the, be Yeah, and people hold different bo- bits of body fat in different areas. And I think that's an important thing that you just touched on there is that when we do go into this phase of like where we're looking to build lean body mass, y- your weight is going to go up. And that's why we don't want to completely just focus on scale weight all the time to determine... Mm-hmm or worth because you will be building lean body mass there's going to be more glycogen there you are going to put on some water and you're going to have more food in the gi trap if you're heading towards maintenance so that's why it's i've done this with quite a lot of clients recently and it's helping people get over that physiological and psychological hold back of like a barrier increasing calories i think when you do that oh my god fucking life is so much better your life actually changes Uh, no for me no joke from the last year it's changed changed my life it's changed my training it's changed my output when i wake up on a day-to-day basis it's changed my cognitive function it's changed my efficiency to work it i'd even say like to, to a certain degree it changed my relationship with you because i'm more positive and happy as well yeah you were a you moody are, grump weren't you sometimes you're just a crank sometimes especially if you're in deficits yeah. for that long and it also what's really sad as well you never ever meant to be moody but sometimes because you were in such a poor psychological place with food, like a lot of the time you'd just honestly like see red and you'd become really angry. Like if you drop something on the floor and I'm like, I pick think, it up. I think I like that anyway though, you know, because I was in a supermarket yesterday. <laughs> I need to be careful about doing this. Do you know like when I'm, I make a mistake or I drop something? Oh, I, go, I go, fuck you. And the, yeah. <laughs> the supermarket the other day, I think I dropped there. Uh, like a loaf or something off the shelf, and I went, oh, fuck you. you. you and the woman behind me was like absolutely gobsmacked. But it's when I make the mistake, I'm just, I just, sh- I just yeah. automatically blurt something out. So I need to be careful when I'm doing that. I think I'm the type of person who actually blurts out funny stuff. Like Kyle always picks up on it. Like last week it was crapping balls, wasn't it? That was you one of my favorite. What you say? It's so weird. I don't know. I, I don't, I don't usually Holy swear balls that much. Is one. Like, um, oh, blimey. I yeah, say you will, quite a lot. You've got like the body. I'm you like are stuck in the 17th century. No, you like the body of Rambo, but the brain of like your nan, aren't you? In in one person. That's, yeah, I just I picked up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nambo. Said Nambo. That's exactly what Lucy is. That's your new name. Nambo. Lucy Davis. I think that's a well cute nickname. Hashtag Nambo. Nambo. But I did Nam- actually. Nambo, do you want a Nando's? <laughs> so, are you going to bang though? <laughs> I just wanted to touch on something in terms of cutting out food groups and this is kind of relevant to like when people have cut their calories really low and things like that but and this is the my point before when you get stuck in that like fat loss phase Mm. and you're still trying to continue it further people start to control their diet in ways that are not sustainable for example taking off entire food groups so you're not eating dairy you don't eat carbs you cut out gluten when you don't have an intolerance present. And this this fear stems from being a deficit for a long period of time. And cutting out entire food groups like gluten, so think like like bread, you then, you, you then have gluten-free bread, gluten-free pasta, lactose, so cutting out all dairy, cheese, yogurt, you know, it can actually cause deficiency of important vitamins and minerals, making the body more susceptible to illness. And this type of anxiety around food is what can lead to eating disorders. I did it when my eating disorder was really, really bad. I cut out gluten 
because I thought, whoa, gluten is going to make me put fat on. Cannot eat gluten. Do you realize, like, if you don't have an intolerance, don't cut out gluten or dairy. Why? Why would you? Why would you then? Because when you cut it out for so long, you can make when you try and reintroduce it, you can actually make yourself intolerant to a food group. Do you know what's funny though? Because pe- and this is two different scenarios, but you'll get people who'll smack lines of coke in at the weekend, but no gluten. No chance. Stay away from gluten. It's bad for you. Fuck me. What? How? How hypocritical can you be? And they'll go and bang booze in and, and, and nail Jaegers till it's fucking six a.m. in the morning. But gluten. Whoa. Yeah. And th- 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 this is the thing. When you do take gluten out of bread, for example, and you have like gluten-free bread or whatever, they have to pack it with loads of other shit to make it taste and be like bread. So you've not really done anything beneficial there you you're actually scared of of the of the gluten of of the dairy obviously you're not saying though like if you have a gluten intolerance oh my god 1000 if you have an intolerance and you it's causing you pain or you think there's something not quite right go to the gp and obviously yeah. get it checked i'm talking about people who think gluten or lactose is actually making them gain weight mm-hmm. Okay, it, it's not unless you actually have an intolerance. I think it's really important to note that don't just willy nilly cut out a food group because it can be, as I said before, really detrimental for your vitamins, your minerals, and making you more susceptible to illness. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. I think um, that's one of the main things that comes from like creeping your calories up that you get more food choice in general as well, so you can oh, make yeah. things more inclusive. And that's why like there's no there's no good or bad foods. It, again, it's just like quantifying stuff. At the end of the day, there's, there's there's often like like good or bad diets. It's just like how restricted people really make them, and everyone's different. But that's the whole point of like why we're talking about muscle building today, and why we want we really want to try, try and drive this home to people of why it's really healthy to build muscle, and why it's metabolically healthy to build muscle as well. And one of the main factors, and you'll hear a lot of people bang this drum, and rightly so, is the changes that it brings, it, it brings to metabolic rate as well. I like when you are holding more muscle mass you are going to expend more energy. So mm-hmm. we're, we're going to burn more calories and we can eat more as a byproduct of it to, to fuel the body. It's it's also better for like um, when we're looking at cutting. So like when we do lose weight, if you're like, have you been for this period and this is what we're talking about we're beefing with, like where you're doing some stages like recomposition, some stages like maintenance or surplus, some stages of cutting and you're changing stuff and because you, you don't have to be always in one phase. As you build these phases of like, all oh, right, I build more muscle. Now, when I go into this cut next time, I can probably be in a slightly higher calorie intake because I've got a little bit more muscle tissue, which is great. Mm-hmm. Because when we look at it, the, the scenario is it's like now when you move, it's like if I were to put, if you were to put like, I don't know, like a couple of pounds of muscle on or a couple of kilos of muscle in the air, depending on like your training age, it's like putting a backpack on you and asking you to do your day to day stuff with a bit more weight in it. Mm-hmm. you are going to burn a bit more calories just because you you got extra weight of you so that's why it, it, it's a great it's great from like a metabolic point of view because it's, that's why when we're talking about okay i want to lose weight okay let's focus on building muscle as well at the same time because like we've, we've touched on a couple of times the byproduct of it as well just focusing on weight losses and no resistance training and building muscle is you are going to look like an empty as the bag yeah well you wouldn't have that shaped your yeah, body shit, and in terms of how you actually build muscle mass i just wanted to touch on this because i think it's important that you also do educate yourself or just so you know a little bit now the process of building muscle is called muscle protein synthesis you might have heard of this so this is obviously just where your muscle increases in size and there are two important stages in mps so the breakdown phase which occurs when you train so mainly resistance training or weight training so the breakdown of the protein in the muscle and then the growth or the synthesis phase, which is caused by ingesting food. And in particular, this is protein-based food. And for building muscle, more in particular, it is when you are in a calorie surplus or an energy surplus and you're above those maintenance calories. You don't have to necessarily be above maintenance to build muscle, but if we were literally talking about the primed optimal environment for building muscle, it is a surplus and it is high protein. But I think it is important for people to know that just how the process of yeah, building yeah. muscle mass does actually work. And I think it's important for us also to touch on today about things like why why like it's why it's good and why it's important to build muscle tissue. Like 
at the end of the day, like, it's, I feel like, and this is subjective and personal to opinion, I just think it looks sexier as well. I oh, thank you. <laughs> it does so, doesn't it? I think it does, I look yeah, at you sure. and I think, whoa, whoa, she's a bit of a warrior. And thank I, you. I think, and again, it's subjective, but I like a female who has some shape, holds some, a bit more weight, holds a bit more muscle tissue. I, I, and I, I think just because it's like, maybe it's become more, and we went through this year of like, everyone wants to be skinny. I think those females who like, did the opposite. I just like that. I just, I just like that look anyway. I think it looks sexy. I think it creates shape. And when we have that lean tissue, it's going to help us in a lot of other situations. Help your confidence as well in a massive way. Mm. And from a, like a psychological point of view, I just, I just, I just like it. I just think it looks saucy. Good. What, you, what do you think? Do. Yeah, I think it's very personal. I think it's very... We're, we're talking about from a personal, personal perspective. Like, you can have an opinion. Do you yeah, like? my personal perspective is... And it always has been muscle is sexy. Like, your bicep the other day when it was for. just like a tennis ball. But that is personally what I'm attracted to. Like, I feel like, for example, if you touch someone like my sister, she actually wouldn't be mass... She would probably love someone in shape who's really active. That's not but wouldn't be as bothered about, like... The yeah. shape. What well, I'm not saying is you need to be a fucking house, oh, no, like, to be attractive. I just mean, like, having the presence of, like, a bit of muscle tissue there. Like, ha- yeah, having something. Yeah. Having something on you. You've got, like, a bum to grab. Something to grab onto. Fucking yeah. get hold of. Yeah. Well, that's okay. That, that was, was aggressive. Yeah. I do yeah, apologize. But it, it obviously helps with other areas of life as well. Like, we've been touching on before with posture. Having increased tissue helps your posture because you have a stronger core. You're going to be able to hold your body better. You often like a more aware of your body. <laughs> exactly. You have a bigger touch to sit on. Help you retract your shoulders. Like These are all important things, and especially when it comes to injury prevention as well. Yeah. So having more muscle tissue can help. Um, and it also makes life easier. Like, it, what, like if we're going to the car, like me and you could tackle like a family shop on one trip I will take four bags per hand you to. do take the piss sometimes the, you, I, Lucy's I that person if you looked car. outside your, your house <laughs> she'd have fucking bags around her head around the leg around the wrist around I the grip arms. stuff in my teeth sometimes like That's I honestly weird. I'm not the type of person to do two trips to the car even though the car is literally two next seconds to my front house. door I will not I will have I will have bags hanging off my freaking ears like I just I'm that committed to the cause Joe, it's funny. This is another funny story. What? Um, is, it, is it about me? No. Okay. It's not, it wasn't that long ago, actually. We, um, you know what my dad's like with the gym and stuff? Yeah. He's 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 never been like a big fan of it. and He's ne- he, he started to change up more now because he asked me about programming sometimes. He asked me to set my program, which I thought was quite cute as well. But, he's ne- he's been like, he's always, he always used to take the piss out of me when I was younger about it. But he never really saw the, the mm. benefits of it. And, we didn't really speak about it as much anymore, but but you hated it when I was young. I think I spoke about this before, but it's funny. We were in um, my house like during this period, like where we went in lockdown, and we had it was me, my mum, my dad in the kitchen, and I had a bottle of wine, and you had the corks on top of the bottle of wine. Yeah, he's trying to get it off for like a good five minutes, <laughs> and he couldn't off. get it off. And I just, do you want to have that? No, five minutes later, I took it off and. Took it off straight away. <laughs> I loosened it off. No, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't. The moment to everyday tasks, though, like just little things like that. It's it does it does help with everyday life as well. And not just those things, like where, but like even for people like the older generation with bags, putting stuff away. You're doing like a deadlift every single day. You're doing a squat every single day when you stand up. Having that extra tissue and that extra strength is going to help in your longevity of life as well. Well, this is the thing that you touched on a really important point before about injury prevention, and if you are underweight for example or your your relatively low body fat like like we spoke about before your knee joints your ankle joints your hip joints will suffer more because your surrounding muscles so say for example for your knee your quad and your hamstring support that knee joint if you don't have like a high muscle mass or you don't have any tissue on your quads and your hamstrings your knee joints are really going to suffer and a great example is my nan and gramps, they did weight training oh, when they were younger. They, they did everything. Like, they're super fit and active. They've got a huge garden. They're always up and down it. My gramps is 90 this year, and he squats every day. And my nan is 83 or 84, and she rows 2,000 meters every day. I'll probably use your nan and is, is an example in this 
But how That's incredible. Wild, it actually genuinely Insane. shows. So they did resistance training. They did it all in terms of longe- longevity of life. Yeah, it's insane. And it's, this is, ties in nicely because one of the silent epidemics that we also face is we often talk about fat and obesity being a big strain on the NHS and, and what's going on. And the thing that we don't talk about enough is muscle. And obviously being, being over fat is dangerous, but being under muscle or under muscular is also dangerous. And there's this, um, I believe that that's why we're talking about metabolic rate. Oh, like all metabolism, it's it's on me- metabolic medicine, like of how we can combat this. And I think personally, I was speaking to Carl about this before. I think the solution to obesity, and this is like, might be very out there for a lot of people, but this is what I believe in. The solution to obesity is building muscle. You look gobsmacked by that. And I'm, I'm just processing it. I know it sounds mad. No, but, I think resistance training. But if you if you change the focus to build a muscle, like we just spoke about the sort of podcast, change the focus to build a muscle. You can still be, and obviously you need to be in a calorie deficit. This is, in, I was going to say, it's contangent yeah. with a calorie I'm deficit. Talk, I'm just talking about the focus though. Like if you change the focus away from like focusing on weight loss, focusing on weight loss, focusing on fat loss all the yes. time, how unsustainable and unenjoyable does that make the process for you? And and the, the longevity of your weight loss journey just becomes so tedious. Mm. Like if you just run like a freak all the time and just cutting calories down and like are on the deficit of a five-year-old child all the time, all the time, it makes the process shit. If we change it up a little bit, okay, okay, we're not going to go into a mega extreme deficit because we want to focus on building muscle tissue. We're going to get the protein intake high. We're going to progressively overload training. We're going to do, going to focus on a step count and not kill ourselves with cardio. Apologies. How much more sustainable and enjoyable does that make that process that you can go in and bang some weight and still lose weight? Yeah, definitely. I think it's one of those things as well where I've had some clients who have come to me because they specifically want to lose weight because they are obese and the last thing they want to do is go for a jog and also yeah. at the weight they are they were at that wouldn't have been good for them wouldn't have been good for their joints it wouldn't have been enjoyable it would have been pretty damn demotivating to think that you just have to run or you just have to do cardio for weight loss y- you don't cardio is actually just great for your cardiovascular health yeah. which everyone should be doing in drips and drabs and it can be great as a tool for fat loss but yeah i massively agree like building the shape and finding enjoyment and doing it that way for weight loss and building the the lean muscle tissue will be thousands times more beneficial yeah get thick to lose fat yeah massively what? so this is this this ties on to nicely what i was talking about before with you now and granddad because i want to talk like why it's important or why it's healthy to focus on building muscle especially as we age and the the main reason for this was and that's why i'm talking about this un, being under muscular and a condition that's constantly rearing his head but it's not something that we hear a lot about it's mm-hmm. called um sarcopenia that hormone no it's a condition wasn't it that the balls have uh, you're, 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 <laughs> you're thinking about like the, um, the that um my, the myostatin I yeah think it is. myostatin hormone what balls yeah. have that you no, can stop the sarcopenia is a, is a condition that's categorized by loss of skeletal muscle muscle mass and function although it is primarily a disease of the elderly its development may, may be associated with conditions that are not exclusively seen in older persons so it's um it's muscle wastage basically so it's muscle atrophy yeah and the reason that I want to talk about this and I've got some stats to do with it is because as we age, we naturally deteriorate and we lose tissue. Yeah. And so does our bone density. Our yeah, bone yeah. So we lose we lose muscle. And there's a reason why I'm telling you this as well is because um, as like now the population, we're living longer than ever before, aren't we? Like we're, still, we're, we're, we're aging. Like they reckon there's going to get to a point where there's going to be more 65-year-olds and 15-year-olds, which is the, be the first time like it's ever happened. Really? Because we're living for so much longer. Um, or, or, or people over the age of 65. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we're living healthier. So we're living longer, but not necessarily healthier and happier. And a lot of this has to do like the, the muscle atrophy that we get at an older age. And basically what the, um, some researchers looked at is that like how much muscle tissue we actually lose. So basically it looks like from the age of 30, we lose three to three percent to eight percent of muscle um every decade 
Mm-hmm. So every decade moving forward after the age of 30, they reckon it's going to deteriorate and that's because of testosterone and atrophy and, and that kind of thing. Um, and, and it's mainly due down to like the, the, well, what leads to is loss of independence. But that's why it's, I just want to reverse a little bit because when we're talking about like how much muscle we hold, obviously we're talking about energy, we're talking about expenditure. And for like me and you sitting here now, they reckon on average we, we burn like a, a calorie per minute, I think it was, average. Obviously everyone's different. And um, that goes up by like 20, 20, 30 times like when we're doing exercise and stuff. Um, and when we lose muscle, we actually open ourselves up to to more disease because of this reason. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's interesting because there's a stat that was saying that we actually spend like ninety percent of our, our time in a seated position. And even those people who are exercising exactly like we've just done this morning, but then sitting down all day, are also at risk because you need to be moving. And this is why we get this te- this um this this figure or this target of ten k steps per day, because just walking can help us keep hold of tissue. And it helps us keep healthy as well in the future. And that's what's really important is that we don't just exercise for an hour a day. There's a guy I watched on YouTube who was talking about this. And what, and what he described was is an, it's it's called like a, an active couch potato. So you do like what your hour exercise, but the rest of the day you just do fuck all. I think that's probably even more relevant now because of lockdown. Yes. I definitely think the increased amount of sitting yeah. has been because of lockdown. Like we've sat a lot more since lockdown it's also that restriction of you can only go out like once a day for exercise and once to the shop and it's like okay you feel really confined to your house oh what's in a house freaking sofas chairs Mm -hmm. you naturally do sit down a lot of the time yeah and and this is what we're talking about in regards like loss of or atrophy is um there was a a a stat was some data that was showing that the stronger an individual is they have like when you get past the age of 65 we have like half the, the death, half the death rate or the chances of, of death. And if you preserve muscle mass, you give yourself a greater chance of living longer. I can fully agree with because, that. Because because well, re- that's that's some research, yeah. Yeah. So in regards to sarcopenia, which is the muscle trophy based at like the wastage of, of muscle and skeletal muscle and function, the these diseases are all linked to it. So um HIV, cancer heart failure, immobilization, uh, hypertension, strokes, cardiovascular disease, all, all linked to it. And this is why we're talking about we might be living longer, but we're not necessarily living healthier lives. And one of the biggest ones um, was to do with immobilization and bed rest. Because obviously as you lose more muscle and you've got wasted, like my nan when she passed away was completely immobilized and it was just down to the muscle wasted because she couldn't get out of bed anymore. Mm. And... This then means that for a lot of the population, they'll start to use wheelchairs, uh, the lift, the elevator, the escalator, and they, they bring this that count down to like maybe 1,000 to 2,000 steps a day. And that's just from like moving from chair to chair or to the bed or to the sofa and that kind of stuff. And what they found was is that these people, people in the first 14 days, for example, when they're, they're in those conditions and their step count comes down by that much is that they will lose 5% of muscle mass in the first 14 days. Wow. Which is crazy. Because you're just not using it enough. So that so that's over the age of 65? It, it, this is for the elderly, yeah. And it, if, if an elderly person is in bed for two weeks, like completely immobilized, like my nan was, they'll lose 10% of muscle mass um, in the first 10 to, 10 to 14 days. Which if you think about what I said before, that's what most people lose in 10 years, in a decade. Yeah. They're losing it in two weeks. That is, is, do you know why? That's what we're talking about, movement, movement. Yeah, well, this is the thing, like, my nan and Gramps both have those. This is those, why I was talking about that, yeah. They have both have those honour watches where they track their steps. And my nan called me the other day, she was like, I've done 5,000 steps a day. I was like, that is blooming fantastic. But I think that's great, actually. I've never even clocked on to that, like, my nan and Gramps, my whole family is super fit and healthy, aren't they? Like, they just are. And what a great tool for Nan and Gramps to have with with like a with a watch on to yeah. just say like, oh Lucy, look what my steps were today. Like, I personally think for the old generation, that's a great little tool to have. I think it helps. There's, there's different things I've done a post about. Um, what's that I'm going to put up? There's, there's there's benefits and there's advances to it. But for a lot of older people, and that's their only form of exercise, I think it's great. It's great for accountability. It's great great to keep track of those metrics. I think that's why your Nan and Granddad, for the age that they are, are so so healthy. 
because this this exact type of research just proves what I'm saying. They did um they did like a dissection of people's muscles like when they got past. There's a 40 year old a trained athlete who's 40. There was a 70 year old untrained, and there was a 70 year old who trained all their life and it showed showed the amount of muscle mass that they kept hold of. And it was so like worrying for that 70 year old who was like untrained and didn't train compared to 70 year old that did train and how much healthier the dissection of muscle was because they, they had that amount of tissue still at that age and how much healthier that individual was just because and that's what i think why your nan and granddad are so healthy and why they'll continue to live like a long healthy life is because your nan gets up and rows your granddad does squat he does like resistance based stuff there's little walks there's walks they've got that garden which is massive that they're up and down all the time and I just think this helps like massively in regards to having that uh, independence in the life mm-hmm. still as well. And this is why it's so important, like not just like talking about us and a lot of people who might be listening to the podcast or the younger generation. I think like if we're able to pass this message on to our mums, our dads, yeah, our nans and grandparents, and and get because I'm doing it with my dad at the moment, trying to get him into more resistance based stuff. And I think it's often not looked at as much because people don't understand it. It's easy to put your shoes on and go for a run. But to set up like kind of some resistance based programming which is specific to the individual and what they can do is a lot more difficult. And if we can educate them, I think it's gonna help a lot in the in the in the long run as well. Yeah, massively and I agree with that. And it actually highlights from what you said there how important it is to to do it from a young age and to educate yourself in your programming and know what you're doing and share it with your parents and things like that. There was actually something that I wanted to touch on as well in terms of, because a lot of people might be sat there at home thinking, okay, so you tell me all this to build muscle, but I'm actually too scared to increase my calories. Yeah, just before you that, I was going to finish off with on this bed bound stuff. I was bed bound for four weeks when I had meningitis. Um, And I lost like three stone. Mm. Like I remember going back to sixth form, my suit was like a fucking tent on me. Yeah. But because I was young, I had that... um, muscle memory there a bit quite quickly whereas elderly don't have that ability so once they're bed bound it's very difficult to build back up yeah definitely so i i know ben's gonna chime in on this but i actually wanted to touch on getting over the fear of increasing calories because from personal experience and we have just been speaking about yes build muscle it's great to build muscle be a bit thicker and things like that and i know a lot of people and especially young girls maybe who are listening or young guys are thinking okay, great, so you're telling me to build muscle, but I'm physically so scared to increase mm-hmm. my calories. And I... Do you know what that's like, sorry? That's like someone with... A, it's what it's like is like someone having anxiety and just going, don't worry, it doesn't help. Just to say, yeah. just, just for us to say, just build muscle. Like, I know how difficult that is. Yeah, definitely. And I've really been there of not wanting to increase my calories. And this is when I did have an eating disorder. And the last thing that I wanted to do was increase my calories and increase what I was eating because there was a huge fear that I would increase my body fat. And when you're not psychologically there with food and and food has a hold over you, I'm not saying you have to have an eating disorder. You might generally just have been in a calorie deficit for such a long period of time that you now don't know how to get out of it. And you're also scared to increase those calories. And in your head you probably know that's not going to happen and you know that increasing more calories will help your shape it will help you build muscle in the long term but a lot of the time it's like you've got a chip on your shoulder or someone talking your ear saying well you're going to put body fat on and what you need to understand is being in a surplus or maintenance would only gain significant body fat for example When a person is in a surplus because they're eating sporadically, they're completely overeating, so they've no idea what they're eating. They're having 10 Mackies a day, you know, completely overeating. Fucking hell, have you been speaking to? No, I'm just trying to broaden the example. Generally making poor daily food choices and also not training. All that there will lead to gaining body fat and increasing your body fat percentage. Now... If you're sat there at home thinking, okay, that's me, I completely overindulge, I don't do any exercise, I actually am obese, okay, that that's absolutely fine. You recognize that you can do something about it. And your goal there would probably be more so weight loss, mm-hmm. do some steps, get in a calorie deficit, etc. But one of the most important things that I did was actually identifying the source of the fear. 
And so this actually, it's a bit more psychology behind it rather than just like increase your calories. So on the surface, it might be a fear of weight gain or fat gain. And it was for me. I wanted to be super skinny. Mm -hmm. I wanted a thigh gap. But truly, truly, <laughs> but truly, <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. Was it Chitty Bang? Chitty Bang Bang, yeah. Um, it's the beliefs that come with the Sorry. weight gain that create the fear, not the weight gain itself. So what is the story that you tell yourself about gaining weight? Does it mean you failed? So if you suddenly put on a bit of weight, if you instantly failed your goals, mm -hmm. do you believe it makes you less attractive? Do you think it makes you less health, yeah. less healthy, less desirable? Like all these things, they're actually the thoughts that go into someone's head. Yeah. No, so I, it's I all agree. psychological and those things, no, 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 they're not going to happen. All your, your focus is to build muscle. Yeah. And you have to pinpoint those fears. I had to say to myself, I'm actually scared of what I think people will think of me because I was so stuck in a psychological relationship with food. Yeah. And that's all I, was, all I was thinking about. I wasn't thinking about my true goal, which was I actually really, really want to build muscle. I was so straight up and down. I was, I was, I had no bum. I was back and legs. You were just a long back. I was a long back. And this whole time I was like, I, I really want to build my glutes. And I had to like be quite stern with myself saying, okay, if you're actually not taking the piss with this goal, and you're serious about it, you've got to increase your calories, Lucy. Yeah. Like you're, nothing's going to change. And I think what people need to start doing is sit, sit your, sit your fucking self down and have a word with yourself and say, if I'm actually, do I actually want this goal? Yeah. Do I actually want to build muscle? And most of the time, yes, the answer is big fat. Yes. It is so hard though, you know, like, and this is the point of having a coach and this is why I had the coach when I was going through this process and have a coach, sorry, is you you judge stuff on like a day-to-day -day basis. And this yes. is why yeah. you started doing check-ins with me again. And I've started monitoring your weight and I give you the weekly average and we change, mm -hmm. and I change stuff for you rather than you doing it. Is because when you have control of stuff, you will make changes based on like a day's change. Yes. And I've spoke to clients about this before. Like I've weighed myself. I weighed myself one morning. I was 202 and I weighed myself the day after to, uh, 210. So it's an eight pound difference. I think what you've got to realize is when you're going for the process of building muscle that the scale isn't gonna um, isn't associated to to fat gain. It'll fluctuate. It'll fluctuate so, so much. much. This is why sometimes I, we have this conversation of like shh, the way that you weigh yourself, and there'll be different people who weigh themselves in different ways. You weigh yourself once a week at the same time every week. You have some people don't want to weigh themselves at all, which is completely fine. You have some people weigh themselves every single day, which again is completely fine because then you can take an average for the week. And that's why sometimes it's good to take your weight every single day because you will see those days and you'll start to see this really um, nice correlation to week to week where some days weight will spike based on when you last drank a pint of water, what your last meal was like the day before, when you last took a shit. And you get these fluctuations, you get spikes and troughs and you can take an average for the week and it averages itself out quite nicely rather than looking at one day because that day that you weigh yourself every day, you might get fluctuations. So it's important to note before that you go into muscle building phase, there is going to be fluctuations on the scale. So you need to kind of mentally prepare yourself for that and know that it's not just fat that you're gaining, you're going to be gaining some lean tissue. You're going to be um, gaining, there's going to be glycogen changes, water changes, increased food in your GI trap. And these are all like psychological things that you've got to prepare for before you go into that. And that's why it often helps to work with a coach to do that, to do that because it can keep you prepared for those changes as well. Yeah, definitely. And it is something we have always offered on the My Coach School and it'd be the same with the app where you have your macros and calories from myself and Ben because the thing is, that's where it gets really hard, isn't it? Because say if someone's tracking their calories yeah. and they do want to build muscle, so say for a girl, I'll do, I'll do myself, for example, like my stature. To build muscle for a surplus for me, I'd have to be 2200 2300 maintenance is around 2000 is, it, is that what you i don't think the comment what we work out your maintenance was my maintenance that. is 2000 okay. so if i have been in a deficit for a while maybe i was stuck in a deficit i was at 1600 and i then go to 1800 and i'm weighing myself weekly 
and my weight could massively spike when my when I do a weigh in yeah. and I think oh my god like why is it spike so much on this specific day and then I could just go into my fitness pal and I could just change it back down to 1,600, yeah, 1, exactly. which yeah. a lot of people do because like you said, they don't have a coach helping them. It's not, a coach doesn't control you. A coach is there to help you through those stages. It's there to help you when you're thinking, oh my God, oh my God, like what's happened? Like why have the scales gone up? Like the perfect example is my client, Stacey. She's incredible. She won't mind me saying. And she, we really hit a plateau in her weight. And her calories are quite low. She was on a very, very calorie restrictive diet before she came to me. And it was really hard to reverse her yeah. her metabolism, basically, and her metabolic adaptions. And I said to her last week, I was like, look, you've been on 1,500. You're very active. Your weight is increasing. I'm going to put you on a diet break for two weeks. You're still going to weigh yourself every day. And her weight, she's lost three pounds. Okay, two things that I want to talk about here. I'm working with a lot of clients at this one at the moment and bringing, bringing their weight back up and, and bringing their nutrition back up in a healthy way because I believe that me and you, as I said before, deal with a lot of ramifications of poor coaching and poor education from other people in the industry and I believe that all, all the work that we do now is trying to reverse that um, toxic knowledge mm -hmm. and improve people's relationship with food and training. Number two... I will see a lot of people, I'm not saying this, this is related to your client, by the way, because I know um, your client stays and she's very bang on with a lot of the, the stuff that she does. Um, but I'll see a lot, and more so looking at females in the fitness industry who will go, I'm sticking to 1,400 calories per day and I'm not losing weight. No, you're fucking not. Mm. You, you are being so restricted with calories to the point where you're overeating, you're snacking, you're fucking off on weekends because, weekend. you, because you're so restrictive of calories. So when a coach says to you, we're going to stick to a calorie deficit of 1,900 calories, they're not giving you that calorie intake because they just want to fatten you up to, to bring you down or because they think, oh, they just picked a number out of the air. They picked the calorie deficit, which is a little bit higher than what you would probably set yourself in regards to it's not as aggressive. Mm. And because they know that the adherence is going to be better, they know that the sustainability is going to be better. They know that you're still going to lose weight on that. They know that you're going to have more energy from doing that. And the reason for that is that when your energy levels are also high, you're probably going to move more. Yeah. So as a byproduct, we get this balance between output and input where you are going to move more anyway. And you are therefore warranted of having those extra calories. And you won't snack as much and you're not going to binge on weekends because you get your hitting satiation with the foods that you're able to include within your diet. And this is a really, really important part of it is making sure that the calories that are set for you are right. Now, this also ties into like the, there's going to be physiological changes of when you are changing calories or when you've been in a deficit for a long period of time because your body becomes efficient. And this is why this thing of, oh, um, what's it called? Um, a lot of people go on about survival mode of diet and um, you go into something. Yes, literally survival mode isn't it uh, starvation mode okay that's it that's okay. it <laughs> so people all be, oh, i'm in starvation mode no you're not this is called isn't it's not starvation it's it's adaption your body will adapt to that calorie intake and because you've dropped right down to 1400 calories your body will now become efficient at running off your body's very efficient at adapting to different calorie intakes and this will now use it as like your new maintenance for a lot mm -hmm. of people at a certain point of course if you're on low calories you're going to continue to lose weight as long as you're sticking to them but eventually and this will happen to me when i was on a deficit for a long period of time your body will adapt to that and it will start to maintain weight at a certain point Exactly the same with when you up calories. So, for example, for me, I went up to maintenance, which was like one f um, 2,700 calories. Stuck to that for a few weeks, and my weight just stayed the same for ages. Yeah. Then we, I'm, I'm at like 3,000 or just over 3,000 now. My weight still stays the same because it adapts to this new calorie intake, and I'm probably moving more as well. So, this your body will need to, and this is when we're looking at reverse dieting. You can slowly start to up your calories when your, your weight is maintaining because we want to like when we're reverse dieting and potentially putting on tissue, we want to look to be adding like 0 0.25 to 0 0.5 pound a week, which is why it's difficult sometimes with reverse dieting to be that specific. But mm -hmm. that's what we're generally looking for. And it helps bring people out this um, really low range of calories where maybe they've, they've had these metabolic adaptations to help them increase the calories, but not put on a load of weight or sometimes to help 
bring calories up from a psychological point of view instead of just going, okay, we're going to move from this really aggressive deficit up to maintenance, which a lot of people can't do. However, I do believe that... I couldn't do that, could I? I had to do it slowly. Yeah, but... For me, I move straight back up. Yeah. Uh, for a lot of people, I think they they it it uh, it's it's completely physiologically fine to do that. But for psychological point of perspective, for a lot of people, they can't do that. So reverse mm-hmm. dieting for some people is the best answer, just to force that adaptation up and up and up and up. Do you know what's so crazy as well? Because obviously, like Ben does coach me, he does all my calories and stuff, and like I give him full control. When you give full control to someone who actually really helps you and has your best interests at heart. It is the best thing you'll ever do. Mm. I, because I had an eating disorder for like a very long period of time and I really struggled with calories, I will always, and I know I will always have some sort of psychological block with food. It, I will, yeah. openly, admittedly. And when I am accountable to Ben, and we've spoke about this, so I sit at around 2,100, I know... I will be able to be about 2,500, 2,400 and my weight is going to maintain. Yeah. Which I would have never... Get me saying that three years ago when I was on like 1,600. And that's with a, a day on a weekend above intuitive eating, by the way, where you probably sit yeah. more around like the two five to 3,000 mark or somewhere between yeah. then. So that again brings your day, your weekly average up a little bit. Yeah, and I've never been so comfortable. Mm-hmm. And this is what it's important to know because you might be sat there now thinking, oh my God, I'm like really stuck at 1,500, 1,600 calories. We've been there. Yeah. We're telling you this because it's come from personal experience as well. But it is a fair... A lot of it does stem from fear. Like I said, pinpoint the fear. Understand why you actually feel like that. Like, what do you think is going to happen? And you have yeah. to address it. I think being in those low states for a long period of time not only have those effects that we know that we just talked about, I think that, that those types of scenarios is what leaves you vulnerable to eating disorders and poor relationships mm-hmm. with food in the long run. And I've, that's where I was. And I've moved from my calorie intake when I was really, really low, which is ridiculous at 1,800 calories. And now it's like 3,000 and the the best shape I've ever been it's literally like what's it's happening. just having that psychological block and if you feel like you're stuck down there um, and you're worried about it then obviously try and get help with that because it, sometimes having someone else to keep accountable to does help and this is what ties in quite nicely to some of the, the psychological benefits of having more muscle and having a, a being more shapely and well built and I think one thing it does massively help with it is with your emotional state like for example if you look in the mirror and how how good does it feel when you go okay like look i haven't seen my back for a while like look at that muscle through the top of my back like my legs feel bigger or more shaped like my biceps look a little bit fuller like you just feel saucy don't you in comparison to go oh i lost a couple of pounds like i look a bit leaner i when you see a bit of muscle gain like fuck me i'm i look good yeah do you know what just really made me smile megan so my sister she sent me a picture the other day because she's really really been working hard and she's always been like me she does do weights and stuff and she's like my legs look so thick lucy because she's always said to me like oh you've got really thick thighs and i was like your legs look so thick look at your legs look at your quads and she she used to hate that she used to never want muscle but now she's she's like pointing her toe in the movie like look at my quad definition and that makes me thrive yeah when it, i think for women in particular it's very very empowering when you do have muscle that, uh, oh, that's a whole nother topic but i it's think very that's empowering. because again i think because meg's like in the fashion industry and i think that from that industry it's massively pushed to be thinner is better oh yeah oh yeah. Well, that's I, where that I, I, think that's, I think that's a topic for another from. for another day. Mm. But um, yeah, and uh, like self confidence, like hitting hitting a new PB, um, hitting like a new pull up PB, getting be able to get in your first pull up, like it fucking feels amazing. Yeah, walking past the mirror and being like, yeah, wow, look at that, look at that shoulder pop. <laughs> <laughs> but it leads to it lo- leads to confidence in other areas of your life. Like yeah. for a guy, and again, this is subjective if you walk into like a place or like a, a club or like whatever you fucking got a bit of a pump on just pump by the biceps <laughs> are fucking the sleeves like strangling the, the bicep like it does make you feel a bit better in yourself i'm not saying that you should base your self-confidence or self-worth on just having more muscle tissue no, but it does impact your confidence that's actually really true and i've never ever thought of that i used to be really like very introverted very quiet when i swam mm-hmm. i was tiny and i was straight up and down i was i was lean but I didn't have like significant muscle. 
And now I would say I'm super confident, yeah. extroverted, extroverted. I am an extrovert and I'm, I am confident within my own body. And that might be because I, because I have built muscle a, a, along my journey. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I've never even thought a bit like, thought about it like that. Yeah. Like when I feel like a house in comparison, like when I'm like dieting, I'm like fucking limp biscuit and I'm like depleted and whatever. It just sometimes I can feel like, confidence a bit low can't be awesome and it's it, it, there's lots of differences it's not just that but it, it does help to have that mm -hmm. um the psychological change and the, yeah. the emotional state does change i think um a good thing for us to, to finish finish off with this is is just looking at like really quick fire ways in which because i don't want I, we can overcomplicate this massively but i think it's important like how we how, look at ways of how we build muscle mm -hmm. the one thing that i want to quickly look on is because a lot of people ask this question is how much muscle can you build in a month? It's a very difficult question to answer because everyone is so different. It depends on your age, your training age, hormones, like the type of split you're doing, if you're female, male. There's, there's so many facts that come into it, but there's, um, I did a bit of digging on this and there's a, a re some research published and it was looking at like the averages. So again, these are averages, but they reckon that an entry-level lifter, so like a newbie, because you're getting those newbie gains, can gain like two pounds uh, possibly three pounds of muscle mass in a month because you're new to the gym so you've got this really hyper responsive state and um, without adding too much additional body fat we know when you go into the gym when you're new you can you can fucking do whatever you want you can hang from the ceiling and just eat whatever you want and you'll still gain you could probably look at a dumbbell and build tissue but as we as we become like intermediate level or more advanced after they reckon we're looking at like a pound maybe a, a month is, is is like an average um and when like we're an experienced lifter you're lucky to build like half a pound of tissue mm. in a month because it becomes way more difficult and this is half they reckon this is half again for women yeah but just because of testosterone levels and the way that we build muscle as females hormones, isn't it? yeah yeah um and again they're all averages by the way they, this is not saying this is how much you will build um so it's something to be wary of so how how can we build muscle how can we look at building muscle and i want to really break these down into really really dumb them down into these these subjects because we could build do a podcast on each one of these progressive overload mm -hmm. um and when we look at the properties of muscle building three oh sorry mechanical tension metabolic stress and muscle damage mm -hmm. so they're the, they're the main um focuses of hypertrophy sorry um and we can look at those when our training um split and if you want to look at more of that google it but the other thing we're looking at is obviously food so where our calories are at uh, like we and lucy were speaking about if we can get our calories just below maintenance to start with put ourselves in that good range and um, to start driving calories up and and moving to that range of anabolism or that stages of, or that state of anabolism is going to help to build tissue because we know that we can get the calories up and especially carbohydrates we move more have more energy to do lifts mm -hmm. and we can slowly increase those calories i always tend to do it like when people aren't putting on like 0.5 pound per week will bump the calories up a little bit again it's nice to be on more food and have some more choices protein intake one gram per pound of body weight so, or 0 0.8 to one gram per pound of body weight. So it's a good place to start. Keep mm -hmm. mind, you don't need to go too much higher because you just you don't won't use it all. Um, maybe if you're in a deficit, it's good to have the protein and take a slight bit higher because you're looking to retain tissue. Um, rest, I think, is one that's massively underlooked, especially sleep. It will massively help us grow, recover, help regulate hormones. Help regulate hormones is a massive one. Which is huge. One. Because yeah. it will, we will get muscle loss if we don't sleep enough. So we need to make sure. I always make sure and try and get eight hours every night now. But not even just sleep though. It's actually taking rest days and allowing your 100%. body to recover, allowing your body to adapt, to uh, rebuild protein breakdowns, muscle protein synthesis, whatever it is. Those rest days are super important. Don't expect to build significant muscle if you're not taking at least one to two rest days that is the other hard thing for by the way the people who are in deficits when you tell them that they need to take two rest days per week is that they often find it from a psychological point of view difficult to take it but if you yeah. explain to them properly in regards like you will not build tissue if you're going to continue to break it down and break it down and break it down it needs to rest and needs to recover it needs to rebuild to then be able to go at it again um and at the same time you're never going to build tissue if you're just slamming it Mm -hmm. you're gonna you're gonna bend the candle from both ends and we're gonna go past that point of maximum recoverable volume again those rest days and sleep type kind of tie in very nicely together and there may be some weeks where then we need to take a deload we need to pull back because mm -hmm. you can't just continue to progressively overload all the time 
Um, so again, keep it keep it basic. Don't overcomplicate it. That is that is basic as it needs to be. When we start overcomplicating things, is when we really start to like fuck ourselves up in the head, and where we start looking at these weird and wonderful methodologies of where people are trying to reinvent the wheel of building muscle. Keep it basic. Yeah, definitely. And that wraps up today's podcast very nicely. As we said at the start, thank you so much if you do leave a review. It actually means a lot to us and we're super grateful and we love it when you share the podcast on Spotify, tag myself, Ben and the At My Coach School. It'll always be shared. Yes, and I think um, for those who are listening on Spotify and iTunes, like if you want to watch the podcast if you haven't watched any episodes yeah like Definitely. jump on your laptop jump on your phone like what the youtube is um is really cool way to i find watch podcasts sometimes and it's really yeah. engaging and obviously you can drop on there and drop any suggestions you want to see of future people on the podcast and uh, we are going to be running a competition next month specifically for the youtube section of the podcast um and yeah i think that's i've rambled enough amazing so thank you so much for listening guys and we will catch you in next week's episode bye bye guys